Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies. Love you guys. So excited to see y'all today. Hello, hello, sweet. I'm just hugging y'all. It's so good to see you all. So good to see everybody. I'm praying for everybody up in the Northeast with all the snow. Hey, I know it's been pretty rough up there. Thankfully, y'all are prepared for it. It would just shut us down. Paul told me yesterday that yesterday was the 25-year anniversary of the blizzard that we had down here in the south. I don't know if y'all remember it from 1993, but whew, Olivia was a little holding baby. We lived in a total electric house and I literally had to heat the house with a kerosene lantern. Of course, we just stayed in the living room and did the best we could. I cooked food on a charcoal grill out on my carport. <laughs> but you know what? That That's really where the determination to make um, changes as far as, as not being dependent on the grid started in our lives. So. That's a little aside to get us going this morning. So we're praying for you guys up in the Northeast. And I reckon we'll get started. Um, today we are going to talk about Esther. And we've been covering some of, some of the uh, women of the Old Testament. And, you know, our, our running theme here for the last few weeks... Um, has been about the purpose of a woman of God and the value of a woman of God. And, of course, you know, everybody knows Esther, every little girl that has spent any time in church, you know, knows about Esther. So we're going to cover her today. And, and I've done quite a bit of study on Esther through the years, but doing this study has really... Um, she has just become a, a, a friend mm -hmm. to me since I've been studying her. And um, um, so I encourage you as you go through these studies, as you spend the time on your own time, um, don't, let, don't let the Bible study we have here on Tuesdays be it. Take, take everything I say, go back to your Bible, you and your Bible, and study it out. Make sure I'm telling you what the Word's saying. Don't ever trust anybody to tell you what the Bible says. You read it for yourself. And use Bible studies like this to help you delve deeper. I, I, that is just paramount. Never just depend on somebody else to give you the Word. I mean, that's needed, obviously, but get in there and dig for yourself and find the truth. And um, So we're going to start with Esther today. We talked about um, Ruth last week, and, and you know, I got, so, I got so teary talking about her, bless her heart. I just love Ruth, and we talked about Sarah. We're going to talk about Esther. We're going to talk about Deborah. There's so many incredible stories. And um, again, I want to preface this by saying don't let some Hollywood movie determine what you think about these women. Hey, Suzanne, bless your sweetheart. We're praying for y'all. We're praying for y'all. I know Letitia was showing it's like y'all like well over 20 inches there. Is that what they're saying or more? We're praying. Good time to get your Bible study going. So let's start with Esther chapter 1. And I added the scriptures about a half an hour ago. Um, we're going to go through most of the book of Esther. And then the extra scriptures that I put in there I'm going to refer to as we go through. But mainly the book of Esther. Um, and I want to lay a little groundwork here about the situation. I try to do that. That's what I do with my, my personal time. I want to see what's going on, what they're dealing with. 
Amen, Stacy. Ruth is incredible. So we're going to start at chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. That's a hundred and eighty days. Yes. When these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace where were white, green, and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple, to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver, upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And, and the drinking was according to the law, None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. In, or, in other words, they weren't required to do one thing or another. They, they could drink as they wanted to drink. There was no rules and regulations and requirements. Um, you know, if the, the king takes a drink, you take a drink. If the king doesn't drink, you don't drink all of that. Um, Oh, hey, hey, everybody, look, I want to show you, total aside, look at my beautiful new mug sent to me by my beautiful Letitia, <laughs> and she sent a matching one for Paul, I love it, Letitia, I'm drinking out of my mug, today I'm having red rhubosh tea, mmm, so good, okay, so we are looking at the feast of King Ahasuerus. And um, this, this feast, this festival, this banquet that he was putting on was to show off his power. That's the whole point. Esther chapter 1 verse 3 through 8. He is showing off everything he's got. He is happy. There was a, a war going on, a battle, and, and he just wanted to show off what he had. He wanted to exalt his status amongst all of his people, amongst his underlings, his princes, and all of the guys that were under him. He just wanted to throw a big festival and show off. And um, now I'll remind you again, let's don't look at this like a movie that you saw about Esther. Let's look at it as the scripture tells us, okay? Very important there. So King Ahasuerus is showing off his pomp, his circumstance. He's brought in everybody. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's got everything decorated. Everything's beautiful. And then we see verse 9. We skip down a little bit. Queen Vashti, or Vashti was having her own ladies party she was having tea party in the women's section because back then the men and the women did not have their party together and it says in verse 9 through 12 and Vashti we'll just say Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus praise God on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Ab Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Hazarus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the royal crown, to show, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But when the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains, but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains, therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. 
So, the king has assembled all his guys, all of his underlings. Yes, I'm praising the Lord too, Shelly. Um, he's got them all there. He's showing off his palace. He's showing off his prosperity. And now he wants to show off his wife, his beautiful wife. Um, this was nothing but a parade of passions, right? It reminded me as I was reading through it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is a perfect example. The lust of the flesh. They were partying, drinking, celebrating, feasting. The lust of the eyes. Uh, all the beauty that was around them. They even described the, the, the hangings and the, the tiled floors and everything. Describing everything. And the lust of the eyes in wanting to bring the queen to be ogled by all of these men. To show her off. Look at my wife. She's a trophy wife. And the pride of life. You know, the pride of life, his moment in he was basking in all of this, you know, praising him and showing off everything. It is temporary, isn't it? It's just temporary. Doesn't last long. The minute it's all over with, you're back into whatever situation you were before the party started. So these are very... nullifying they don't they don't bring the joy that humans assume they're going to bring only the joy that comes from the Lord is lasting and that can happen in a cardboard box on a street corner homeless the joy that comes from the Lord transcends the circumstances, the environment, the anything. It's there all the time. And if you have a fleeting joy, you really need to examine where you're finding that joy. Okay? So we've got this big event going on and Queen Vashti refuses to come. Now, I've heard a lot of, of sermons and messages about this. People defending her saying, well, she did not want to be exposed. I even heard one time that um, the way he addressed this situation, he wanted her to come in literally naked to show her off. I don't believe that. I don't see that in Scripture. I don't see that in the historical rabbinic writings where they're talking about this. I don't see that anywhere. Um, what I do see is a king... Um, who was very focused on the law. Now, if you read the book of Esther, you go through that, and I'll show you here as we go through this Bible study, place after place after place, it is, is talking about the law. He was very aware of the laws that had been set down in his land. He wanted people to follow the law. He wanted to follow the law. It was very important to him. And when the queen did not come, she was breaking a law. But let's look on Esther chapter 1, verse 16 through 19. And Mimikan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes which have heard of the deed of the queen, Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. 
Now, now I want to say this, and I want I want y'all to hear me on this. In this Bible study today, I'm going to be stepping on some. serious points remember the the running theme that we're going through is is our value before God and our purpose as women and I want you to keep that in your mind that there every iota every tiny little thing that happens in our life is for a reason I do not believe anywhere in Scripture there is any evidence of something called coincidence or chance or accident. There is no such thing for a child of God. Everything that happens to you as a child of God is for a purpose. And until that becomes reality, until the rhema of that takes place, we still struggle with wondering whether or not God knows what he's doing. We've got to lock that in and understand that God knows exactly what is happening at all times. And it all is for a purpose to, to make us like Christ to ultimately have us in perfect reconciliation position with God himself, which was provided by the blood of Christ, and of course, to spend eternity with him in heaven, all for a purpose. So as you look at the scriptures and as you go through and, and digest what is happening, it all works together. Now, Queen Vashti ignored her husband's instruction. She did what she wanted to do. We can sit here and say, well, maybe he wanted her to do this, or maybe that was just a room full of drunken men, and he just wanted to bring her in there and humiliate her. We don't know that. We don't know that. He was obviously very proud of her. He obviously wanted to show her off. But I'm not going to sit here and go through his ulterior motive for that. Um, but she disobeyed her husband. Esther, chapter 1, 20 through 22. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes. And the king did according to the word of Mimikin, for he sent letters unto all the king's provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Now ponder on that just a second. Again, every Bible study I say, Examine the fruit. Look at the fruit. What is the fruit of whatever is going on? I just said every circumstance that God allows in our life is to bring us more like Christ. When I look at what happened, whether we think we've got the idea that Vashti did well to not come to her husband. Again, I don't, I don't agree with that. Because that's not what's born out in the scripture. That's not the fruit. They were saying she has ignored your request. She has openly defied you. And it's not just going to affect your house. It is going to affect every house in the kingdom. 
This is the leader of the nation. And her disobedience, her open rebellion to what her husband has asked her is going to affect everyone, every home. It's going to empower rebellion in the headship order of the home. You know, I think I can safely say that we see that in our nation now. Amen. Amen. We can see this problem in our nation, and we can sit around and speculate about when it started and how it started and why it started, and it's because the men didn't do what they were supposed to do, and they were weak, so the women had to take over, yada, 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 yada. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It does not matter the circumstances over here. What matters is what we do with it. Jesus was sinless. He was falsely accused. He was beaten. He was tortured. But at any moment, at any split second, he could have called down legions of angels and changed the situation. Do you all agree? He didn't. What goes on out here is between out here and God. What goes on here No. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. No. Whatever happens, uh, well, that's what I'm saying right now. What's going on out here is out here. What's going on in here is in here. God knew before I was ever born that the circumstances of my birth, Angie, the circumstances of my birth, yes, 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 Yoshana, yes, that's exactly it. The circumstances of my birth, my parentage, my siblings, the home or lack of a home that I was in, all of those things I could not change. I couldn't do anything about that. I could only do as I grew up and came into a knowledge and understanding of God. That I can do something about. And all of those things that happened to me as a little girl beyond my control, all the things that happen now in my life beyond my control, I cannot change. But God in his omnipotent wisdom can look down, already look down, before the thing ever started, before the earth was ever formed and said, okay, Angie is going to face this, this, and this. I'm going to equip her through the blood of my son, through the power of the, the guiding work of the Holy Spirit to have this, this word, this laborer, this experience, this moment, she's going to look at this flower and she's going to see the honeybee that's going to hit the petals of that flower and she's going to have a moment right then and the Holy Spirit is going to be in place to drop into her spirit. How I take care of that honeybee and I will take care of her. All of these inane, seemingly pointless moments of our life are used by the Holy Spirit of God to grow us, to strengthen us, to empower us, to face what's going on out here. It's all for a reason. He didn't do evil. God doesn't do evil to us. Evil happens out here because we live in a fallen world. But God provides 
everything we need to successfully move through it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? I know that that sounds ultra simplistic. I know that that sounds like, yeah, well, I don't know. That just, that's just, I, I know this. This is my testimony. This is my life. I'm not the oldest woman on this Bible study. I haven't been probably through the worst things that have been experienced on, in the lives of the women on this Bible study. But I'm going to tell you, without question, not even a splinter of a doubt, that I know beyond everything that the God who created this earth loves you beyond measure. And there's not a moment in time, there's not a thought that pops through your head that he has not provided truth and a way to help you fight the good fight. He wants you to succeed. So if he can take from nothing and create the universe, he can put a honeybee on a tulip at the right moment to give you hope. Does that make sense? Do you, are y'all getting what I'm saying there? It really is that simple. It really is. What you have to do is open your eyes and see it happening. And I mean your spiritual eyes. You have to be walking. That's why he said pray without ceasing. Because in that prayer you're having that conversation, right? He's, he's speaking all the time if you're listening. Okay. Ugh. I got way off of Esther, didn't I? Well, I didn't. It is Esther, but. So anyway, this situation happened with Queen Vashti. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so this situation happened with Queen Vashti for a purpose. Now, I don't know what happened with Queen Vashti later. Wouldn't it be wonderful to think that she repented for God before because of her rebellion and and the whole process brought her into an understanding of God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Maybe she got to know Queen Esther later on and, and Queen Esther explained to her about God. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Okay, so this decree was sent out into all the land to keep the proper headship order in the home. And I wanted to stop there and go to a few scriptures about this. The fruit of what happened with Vashti and Ahasuerus is a biblical truth. And I was talking with Letitia uh, last week. Amen. I was talking with Letitia last week, or was it the week before Letitia? We were talking about some, some doctrinal issues privately. You need to find out the truth of what you believe. And it's got to be based on scripture. It can't just be based on what you think. It's got to come from scripture. Okay? So a truth, an undebatable truth in scripture, is that God designed husbands and fathers to be the head of the home. This passage, Esther chapter 1, 20 through 22, actually Esther chapter 1 shows us that God's perfect design, even though we're looking at not necessarily a godly king, was that men were to be the head of the home and women were to submit. I will bear that out with scripture. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This is a result of Eve's rebellion. Yes, this is a result of Eve's rebellion 
and God set this as a truth from this point on. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Wives, submit yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, ladies, we're going to have a Bible study about submission. And I'll warn you a week or two in advance so that you can get ready for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 1 Timothy 3, 1-4 This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth the good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, vigilant not vigilant, vigilant, Sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Ruler? Of his own house. First Peter 3 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Okay. Colossians 3 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Okay, so there is one, two, three, four, five, was that six? Six passages of Scripture, Old and New Covenant, Old and New Testament, that tell us that men are supposed to be the head of the home and we are supposed to submit. Vashti did not submit to her husband. For whatever reason, obviously, we don't know Vashti's heart. She did not submit. The example of her lack of obedience to her husband's instructions was going to permeate the entire nation and bring chaos. The king established a law to ensure that this did not happen. It was a law. The Old Testament is about written down laws because the Holy Spirit had not come and was not working within the heart to bring heart and, and spirit repentance within them. So laws had to be written. I know that's getting into doctrinal issues, but still, it's fairly clear. I don't know of anybody that would disagree with that. But... Until the Holy Spirit came and wrote the law in their heart, it was actually written down on paper. Wives, submit to your husband. Your husband is in charge. If you do not submit, there will be consequences. We now have that written in our heart. So, Vashti did not honor her husband. She did not obey him. She was put away for a better to be found. Esther chapter 2, 5 through 7. Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Je Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is, Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Now, I share this to, to make it clear. Mordecai was taken in a um, capture, and he was taken to Shushan. He was... Um, 
a Jew. Um, they were taken uh, from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. And Esther was his cousin. I've heard people say that she was his niece, but she wasn't his niece. She was his uncle's daughter, so that made her his cousin. She was much younger, obviously. And the Bible tells us that she was fair and beautiful. Um, he raised her as a Jewish girl, and her name was Hadassah. Esther would have been her, uh, her I guess, Babylonian name or whatever. She was an orphan. She knew she was an orphan. Remember when we talked about Ruth? When she was, she came into Canaan with with Naomi. She was uh, a widow. She was childless. She was homeless. She was a stranger in a strange land. And she was new to Jehovah God. She was just learning. She was born and raised in a country that worshipped an idol, Shemosh, that sac people sacrificed their children to. So Ruth had a big, a big package coming with her of, of struggle. Esther was a Jewish girl raised by a devout Jewish man, but they were in captivity. They were slaves, prisoners. Her parents were dead, so... You know, she didn't have her mom and dad. Uh, it doesn't say anything about siblings. Um, so she was not she was not Miss Hollywood. She was not in a perfect setup, right? Uh, Esther 2, 8 through 10. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard. The one about the wives submitting to the husbands and, you know, someone else being chosen. Uh, many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace to the custody of Haggai that Esther was brought also into the king's house to the custody of Haggai keeper of the women now this was a eunuch this was a man who had been castrated and he was in charge of the women in the king's household and the maiden pleased him and she obtained kindness of him and he speedily gave her her things for purification for such things as belonged to her, and seven maidens, which were meet to be given her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not. So her uncle has said, don't tell him you're a Jew. She was fair. She was beautiful. Um... And she pleased this head eunuch that was in charge. Here's the thing. Have you ever known a physically beautiful person, beautiful woman, but she had a mouth like a sewer and an attitude to go along with it. Physical beauty only goes so far. And then that mouth takes over. Or then that haughty attitude takes over. Or that snotty snobbishness takes over. Or that pride. Or that air of entitlement beauty physical beauty only goes so far am i right esther was more than beautiful god knew that esther would be taken into captivity he knew that her parents would die probably in the battle to take them captive I just assumed that. He knew that she would be raised by her uncle. He knew all of this. He made her fair and beautiful. That was a decision God made. He did not he did not decide that for my life, but that's okay. 
But all of that beauty can be lost quickly if ugly attitude is there. So when I think about Esther, I think deeper than that physical beauty. She won the favor of this head guy in the women's area. Think about it though, ladies. There were a lot of beautiful maidens brought. Probably some stunning women. What set Esther apart? Was it because she had the most perfect figure and face? Did she have the most beautiful hair? Or was it the whole thing combined? Did this man see something in her in addition to her beauty? Yeah. When I was little and we used to watch the Miss America pageant, I remember sometimes being surprised at who won because I thought somebody else should have won. They were much prettier than the one who actually won. Do you ever, you ever remember those Miss America pageants? Do they still have them? I guess they do. I remember one time specifically turning around and looking at my brother and saying, Do you think she's pretty? And him going, Yeah, she just won. And I, I remember thinking, She's not pretty. Beauty is a subjective thing, right? Beauty to one person is not beauty to another person. There has to be something more to truly make a woman beautiful. And I did a Bible study on this right not too long after we started on, on beauty. And if you haven't heard it, I encourage you to go back and watch it. Um... But I think Esther had something more. And as we go through this, I think you'll agree with me. Yes. <laughs> so, he's, this guy, Esther has caught his eye. He's hurried up the process of her purification. He's given her, her the things that she needed. He's given her special ladies to come and help her. Um, and he's preparing her to go before the king. Now, let me share with you a little research I did. In this situation, all of these maidens were considered brides of the king. But from that pool of, of brides of the king or concubines or whatever you want to call them, one would be chosen to be the queen. This man obviously chose Esther as the favored choice that he was going to put her forward. Um, Esther chapter 2, 13 and 15 through 17. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to her to go with her out of the house of the women into the king's house. So in our day and age, we are appalled at the thought of this happening, this group of women being prepped to go and consummate with a king like this. But in fact, this was, this was what happened during that time period. And, and you know, we're not going to get into all the problems of it, but every one of these girls was prepared as a bride to the king. They were given the option of anything they wanted. They could choose whatever clothes they wanted to wear, whatever perfumes, whatever jewelry, whatever accoutrement they wanted to take with them for their night with the king. And, um, and then we see in verse 15, Now when the, the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. She required nothing, 
but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. She didn't ask for anything extra except what this, this eunuch gave her. She trusted the will of God. She trusted the will of God. So Esther was taken in unto King Ahasuerus, unto his house royal in the tenth month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. She had a purpose. She had a calling on her life. And I just reckon, up until that moment in time when he chose her, she walked in a great deal of concern. How could any woman not be going through this process and not have great concern for her future. Verse 20 of chapter 2. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people, as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. Esther obeyed. Now we see in every instance of this story when Esther was taken along with the other maidens and taken to the house royal she obviously obeyed Mordecai by not telling that she was a Jewess. She obviously obeyed Haggai the head chamberlain and did what he told her to do once again, we see, as she's brought into this situation, she is walking in obedience to what she's been told to do. Obedience is key. Over and above sacrifice. Over and above beauty. Over and above everything else. Obedience is key. We saw that in Ruth. Ruth was an obedient daughter-in-law. She was an obedient wife. She was an obedient follower of God. Esther is obedient. Remember, Sarah was obedient, left her homeland, followed her husband, even when he essentially gave her away and said, tell him you're my sister. But when she decided to do things her own way, what happened? Ishmael showed up. Obedience is key to living the purpose that God has for our life. Doing it our own way is only going to bring disaster and crisis. Now, I'm going to move on quickly. Haman Haman was placed in a high position. Haman was an Ag Agite. He was actually a descendant of one of the concubines of Esau. Um, do you remember the stories about the Amalekites coming to destroy the Jews in the battles of, with the Amalekites? Haman was a Mal an Amalekite. He was an enemy of the Jewish people by heritage. His entire background was to destroy the Jews. So when he found out that Mordecai, who would not bow to him and show reverence like everybody else, when he found out that Mordecai was a Jew, he came up with a very skillful plan to destroy him. <coughs> um 
he got mad. He got insulted. And it all worked to a perfect plan that the devil wanted to use. Haman was also an astrologer. And I found this out in my study. Um, in Esther chapter 3 verse 7. As they're deciding when to do all of this. When they're going to destroy the Jews. In the first month, that is the month Nisan. In the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, which is lots, like rolling dice. That is the lot before Haman, day to day, and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. They sat there with him, essentially rolling the dice to figure out which month was the month they needed to destroy him. And I read this. In a lot of historical documents, Josephus and Matthew Henry commentary, and a lot of the rabbinic, y'all can look this up, do your own research, don't take my word for it. But every time they rolled the dice, there was some reason they didn't destroy the Jews that month because God had placed a blessing on that month for the Jews. Isn't that interesting? So they, they, they then got to Adar, which mm -hmm. is actually equivalent to right now, March. Adar was the fish month. And he said, well, we're going to do it then because this big fish is going to eat up all those little fish. I thought that was really interesting. But he was an astrologer and he counted on the stars. I also discovered something else. It is, it is a well-established belief in the rabbinic histories that because of his history of the Amalekites, his heritage, his clothes were embroidered with images of the idols of the Amalekites. So every time someone bowed to him, they were bowing to an image of an idol, and Mordecai refused to do so. Isn't that interesting? The Word of God is amazing. Esther 3, 8 through 9. Haman tells the king of a group of people that were scattered, he said, scattered and dispersed. And that they had strange rules and customs. And he, he made it out like this was a bunch of fanatics just sort of mixed amongst the people. And he told the king, you know, they're not, they're not profiting the kingdom. We need to, to get rid of them. He misled the king. He never said the Jewish people. He said there's a group of people. Read that for yourself. But remember, King Ahasuerus was very focused on law and obeying the law. And this Haman presented everything to him to be legal. He, he said, you know, you need to make a law. Well, that was just right up King Ahasuerus' alley. He loved that. So let's move to Esther 4, verses 4 through 5. Now this law had been written, and the word has already gone out that the Jewish people were going to be killed in the month of Adar. Um... Mordecai has gone through the streets in sackcloth and he's bemoaning and wailing the destruction of his people. Verse 4, So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Then called Esther for Hatash one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to tend to her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So being a woman, she got to find out what's going on. So she sends out there, she says, take him some clothes. He's walking around nearly naked in sackcloth. He won't take them. He's so upset and so devastated. She's still clueless. So then she sends one of the 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 guy's there that, that works with her, and she says, please, go find out what's going on. 
Esther 4, 8. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. So Mordecai sent back and says, this is what's about to happen. Um, Esther 4.11 All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king unto the inner court, I think, yeah, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king for 30 days. Talk about getting nervous. Mordecai wants her to go do something, but she hasn't even seen the king in 30 days. A month she's not gone in before him. This is not a brash woman. This is not a woman who is bossy and knows what needs to be done and I'm just going to do it and y'all can just deal with it. Why do we get that attitude? Why do we get that attitude? Why do we think that we know everything that's right and we're just going to tell people how it is and y'all just have to deal with it? Does that sound familiar? I renounced my membership in that club a long time ago, but every now and then, wow, that ugly old Angie pops out. Y'all ever have that? Now, if y'all say no, I'm going to get upset. Esther, chapter 4, 13 through 16. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Ladies, we've heard this a thousand times, have we not? This story. If I perish, I perish. I'm just going to do it. Just Even if they kill me, I'm going to do it. I have said those words myself. But I can honestly say, looking at you eye to eye, it hadn't always been with godliness. This woman knew and probably had seen with her own eyes people who had broken this law and were sentenced to death. She knew what she was facing. She was not brash. She was not haughty. She was not so proud of herself because she was just gorgeous and the king chose her. You know, this was a humble woman. I believe that with all my heart. She was a humble woman. She asked them to pray. She prayed. She fasted. I guarantee you she cried more than a few tears. She needed God to strengthen her. So then what happens? She puts on a royal outfit. She didn't feel beautiful. She didn't just go in there and her regular stuff. She put on the whole thing. And as a child of the king, you've got a royal outfit. It isn't that outfit you bought at the mall the other day or ordered from the 
online store. That all that jewelry that you wear, pointless. Makeup doesn't do a thing. You can you can have fifteen hairdos, does not matter. What matters is your royal outfit. When you put that outfit on, mountains will move. All that other stuff, all those worldly trappings that we be we get in bondage to, that's all mimicry. It's to imitate what is lacking inside. I'm being honest. I remember the first day I walked out of my house with no makeup on my face. I cannot tell you how hard that was for me. You may be a woman who's never worn makeup and you can't understand what I'm talking about, but I wore a lot of makeup and I wore it well. I knew how to do it. I'd had classes. I went to modeling school. I knew how to put it on and put it on right. And the first day I walked out of my house without it, I felt buck naked. But that's the day it dawned on me. My beauty had to come from within me, not without me. Not without me. She put on her royal attire. She stood in the court and waited for the king. The king was not in there. And that little movie where they got her running through the courtyard in the rain and busting through the doors and all of that business, that's wrong. That's a lie. That's not what the Bible says. That's all a Hollywood makeup thing. It said she stood in the court and the king sat himself by the gate. She stood there with humility and dignity and holiness. That was the beauty that surrounded her. She put on that royal attire I believe to remind the devil that she had a right. But ultimately the king decided it, didn't he? In verse 4. Well, let me, before I read that, let me tell you the king said, offered his scepter, which meant, okay, Queen Esther, what do you want to tell me? She didn't bust out right then and start laying it on the line. How dare you proclaim against my people? She didn't rant and rail. She didn't bust into tears and just start wallowing in the floor. And you just don't know what's happened. It's just horrible. She had dignity. And she had thought it through. And she had prayed. And she had fasted. And what did she do? Oh, is it buffering? She invited him to a tea party. <laughs> I'm not kidding. She invited him to a tea party. Except they didn't have tea. They had wine. So she invited him to a wine party. I love that. So she said, will you and Haman... Esther answered, If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. So he came. And then she, he said, What would you have? And she said, Will you come tomorrow? So she invited him to another one. Now, I don't really understand why there was two tea parties. I don't understand why there was two. But I know it was the perfect plan of God and she said if I have found favor 
in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king hath said. Now, I am way over, and I'm going to stop. Because I have promised myself to be diligent, to stay within my time, even though I've gone over a little bit. I want you to get into the book of Esther, and I'm asking you this. And I want you to read, starting in chapter 6, what happened. Now, if you have watched that One Night with the King movie, I want you to put that out of your head. That's not a scriptural movie. I want you to read the Word of God the way God wanted you to read it. See what happened. I want you to put yourself in the place of this woman, this orphan girl who was in captivity in a foreign land. And I want you to ask the Lord to reveal to you what was really going on and see yourself in that girl. She was young. She was young. Oh. <laughs> I want y'all to read. I want you to read. And next week, we're going to talk about what happened because it's going to take a little while. It seems like it was a very simple thing. We know the end of the story. But there is so much meat in the next couple of chapters. I really want you to get the Holy Spirit to begin showing you yourself in Esther's situation. <laughs> okay, y'all are messing me up. No, I can't. I can't keep going because I know what the Holy Spirit showed me. I guarantee you there's not one of you who has not got something in your life that you don't need. A mighty move of God. It may not be for you personally. It may be for your people. It may be for those that you love. It may be for yourself. But as you read the... And when, and when we get off of here, go ahead and read it. But it's got to... It's got to... It's got to come to you by the Holy Spirit. Esther chapter 6, 7, 8. Finish out the book. Y'all are messing me up. Y'all are struggling. Y'all making me struggle. I want to give all the good stuff, but I want the Holy Spirit to give it to you more than me. And when I when I close this thing off, I'm gonna sit here and cry for thirty minutes. God loves you. He loves the people that you love. But I'm going to go back to what I said earlier in the hour. There's not a moment in time that you draw breath that he does not have a plan. And I, I want you to look in this. I want you to finish reading this. And, I, and we'll talk about it next week. But I want you to let the Holy Spirit reveal to you. When you pick up. When you pick up a pen, or when you pick up a pencil, at some point you're going to pick that thing up and God's going to show it to you. Truth. Out of, out of everyday things. I remember the day when God showed me why he put an eraser on a pencil. He said, you're going to make mistakes. 
That's why there's an eraser on a pencil. I cried that day. Ladies, there's truth to be gleaned out of the Word of God, and I'm asking you, spend this week, and let's come back together next Tuesday. I'm looking forward to hearing what the Holy Spirit shows you. I love you all, and I will see you next Tuesday.